So we just heard Richard and Lee talk about uh, the difference between the person and the situation, and they provided a few really good cognitive processes, reasons for, these, uh, for this distinction. And one of them was selective attention. Uh, so we only have a certain amount of information that we can process, and my efforts are focused on you, on what it is that you're saying, uh, how you're behaving, uh, to the exclusion of the context. Another that Richard made reference to was uh, the, the cultural difference uh, between, uh, for example, Easterners pay attention to the context and the person is situated within that context, but the context comes first and then the person is, is located or situated somewhere within that. And relatedly, uh, Lee made reference to the language that we use. We have a lot of words, we have a lot of language for personality characteristics. Uh, we don't have many words for the situation. Uh, the situation where you feel brave or something, or uh, yesterday at work, uh, I was in a very honesty situation, right? You almost have to bend over backwards to make uh, reference to situations that elicit certain behaviors. Yeah, I was sitting in traffic the other day and uh, this car came in and it, it cut me off and I knew that he was just trying to get to the front of the line to push in front of me hate that. and I was outraged I said what an asshole what kind of person would do that and then I'd just been preparing for this episode on the distinction between uh, the person in the situation and I stopped myself I yeah. said okay hold on here what if it had been me who cut off somebody else in traffic, yeah. the, the, the rationalization for my behavior would have been, oh no, I'm, I'm in a rush. I can't be late for the third time uh, to work for the third time. But the, <laughs> when I was sitting there uh, in the car and somebody else cut me off, I attributed their behavior to themselves. And this is a common thing. Uh, we tend to attribute the behavior of other people to personality situations, to, to character traits, but we tend to attribute uh, the explanation for our own behavior to, um, to situational variables. So we've spoken about already the weakness of the situation, the weakness of, uh, of personality variables in predicting uh, future behavior. But let's talk about the strength of the situation in predicting behavior now. So we've spoken about the Good Samaritan. Now there's a great study by Solomon Ash. Uh, so imagine you were asked to participate in a vision experiment. This is a visual acuity test. And you come into a room, uh, there's four other people and you sit down at the end of the table. The experimenter shows you some lines. There's a line on the left of a particular length and then, then three lines on the right of differing lengths. And your job is just to say, okay, which line on the right is the same length as the one on the left? Yep. Okay, you can see quite clearly in this particular case that the answer is B. Those lines are exactly the same length. Now, the first person responds, shouts out to the experimenter, C. The second person responds, shouts out to the experimenter, C. The third person, C. The fourth person, C. Now, what do you do? Do you stick to your guns? You can quite clearly see the answer is B, and you, do you shout out B, or do you go with the group? Now, what Ash found was that very often, people will go with the group. They will shout out C, even though they can see the answer is, is B. So this is called social conformity. Uh, often people will go with the group because they, they want to fit in, or they think the group has access to information that they don't. That's right. It's a really strong demonstration of, of social conformity. Another really landmark classic uh, probably the, the most well-known experiment in all of psychology and probably the most controversial mm. uh, is one by Stanley Milgram. And in this experiment, you have a similar sort of setup. You have uh, one person who's working for the experimenter uh, and one person who's participating in the experiment. And so they come into the lab and they're welcomed by a man in, in, a, in a white lab coat, very official looking uh, character, uh, the experimenter. And he has the two people uh, in, in, in the experiment, he assigns them one is going to be a teacher and one is going to be a learner. Uh, but in fact, it's rigged. The person who's working for the experimenter is always the learner. Mm -hmm. The person, the, the actual subject, is the teacher. So he brings them uh, into a room and shows them. He, he hooks up the learner into a, into a chair, uh, almost like an electric chair, mm -hmm. right? He straps them in. They're completely restrained. And 
uh, hooks, the, hooks up a bunch of electrodes uh, to that person. And so the idea is that he takes the, the teacher, the, the participant in the experiment, into another room where you can't see the learner. They're, they're locked away, they're tied to a chair. Yeah. And what they can do is uh, the, the job of the teacher is to teach that yeah. person uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of word pairs. Yeah. So they communicate with the learner over, over a microphone. A microphone, what is it? Uh, that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And so you're, you're saying over a microphone, you read the question, the learners in the other room, they respond in a particular way. If they get it right, fine. If they get it wrong, they get an electric shock, okay? Now, they, the, the experimenter shows the teacher this switchboard of electric shocks, and it goes all the way from five volts, right? And so you, you click a little switch, and you click the button, and bzz, it shocks the learner in the other room. Then 10 volts, 15 volts, 20 volts, all the way gradually going up to 450 volts, right? And so they're reading over the microphone. Okay, learner, uh, they read the word list, and they give them a, the, a multiple choice question, and if the learner gets it wrong, which they did frequently, they get an electric shock, okay? And so they're doing this time and time again, so they're up to 100 volts, sorry learner, bzzz, and they yeah. shock the person well, if they get so it, if they get it wrong, the volts increase every that's time right. they get Each it time wrong. they get it wrong, it, it, it increases, yeah. that's right. Now, the, the whole point of the experiment in this case is to see how far the teacher will go up this gradually escalating, uh, uh, ranked set of voltages, right? So it keeps going up time and time again. How many people will actually go to the end and elicit 450 volts to that learner in the other room? Yeah. Didn't okay. it say lethal in brackets it's as well? X, 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 X. 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 That's okay. right, it yeah. says at the far end. It doesn't even have a label anymore, mm -hmm. right? How many people will actually go to the end? And so clearly, when they're going through this experiment, often the teachers are very dismayed, right? They, so they uh, uh, elicit a shock and they hear the learner in the other room saying, stop, stop, this is hurting, right? And they, they look past and they, they look back to the experiment and say, I, this is, the, no, we can't go on, like this is dodgy. And all the experimenter does, they just sit in the chair and sit back and say, uh, the experiment requires that you continue. Please continue, please continue. And, and they say, well, no, the guys, in the, please continue the experiment, we, we insist. And so on. There's, the there's no permanent yeah. Yeah. tissue damage, whatever that means. Yeah. Uh, please continue. Now, how many people are actually going to obey and go right to the end? Now, most people predict that it would be nobody, right? Maybe one person, some psychopath, psychopath or something, <clears throat> right? But in fact, the vast majority, it's quite a few people, I can't remember the exact number, I think 30% or something, 40% maybe, continued to the very end of the experiment and elicited very lethal shocks to that person. You even hear them in the other room going, stop the experiment, my heart, and then they stop responding and they continue to elicit shocks after, after the person is completely silent, mm -hmm. right? And, and this was a real shock. This is an ethical sort of conundrum. This is moral callousness on, uh, on scale, right? This is, this is terrible. But in fact, just like you or I, anyone in that particular situation is gonna be feeling yep. exactly the same sort of thing and will probably elicit shocks, just like they did in that experiment. Yep, a similar one on the power of situation is called the bystander effect. Now, in this experiment, the participant comes into a room and they're asked to fill out a questionnaire and uh, the experimenters, they're not in the room, but they start uh, pushing smoke through the bottom of the door and in the other room. So the smoke just starts billowing in. And when people are in that situation, filling out a questionnaire on their own, most of the people take control of the situation. They go outside the room and they, they look for help. They think it might yep. be a fire or something like that. Now, the tricky part of this experiment here is uh, we set up the same situation again, but this time we have more people in the room filling out a questionnaire. There's two more people you know, to the right of you, but unbeknownst to you, they're actually working for the experimenter. Now, you're in a room with two other people filling out a questionnaire, and you start to see the smoke billowing through the room again. You're looking here, and you look to the right, and you can see those other participants are still beavering away at their questionnaire. You can see that they look at the smoke, but then they look away, they're not too concerned. Now in this situation, people are far less likely to take control of that situation and move outside the room and look for help. 
That's right. This is, in each of these cases, that was a perfect example of the bystander effect. Mm -hmm. So we have social conformity, obedience, bystander. These are three situational factors that are ridiculously robust, right? Put pretty much anyone in the same circumstance and you get the same sort of effect. Yep. Robust, yeah, robust in the sense that it's far more likely to predict behavior than yep. a pers personal personality explanation. That's right. So robust in the sense that it happens again and again and again, whoever is in that particular situation, yeah. right? So I think this is what uh, Lee Rost regarded as, uh, he labeled it the fundamental attribution error. It's so fundamental uh, that most of us in the same situation would do exactly the same thing. Uh, so we talked with Lee and, uh, and Richard about that fundamental attribution error. Uh, and here's what they had to say.